we'll go ahead and get started. I think this is going to be everybody. I'm not sure if Janice will be here or not, uh, but to everybody else that I'm aware of, this is going to be it. So we're, we're taking a little bit of a break from Proverbs. Uh, we've got, counting this Sunday, three Sundays until Easter. Uh, so I thought since we ended chapter 9 in Proverbs, that kind of serves as an introduction to the rest of the book. This would be a good point to kind of pause and and the focus on some Easter related uh, lessons. And I'm just making this stuff up as I go, but the Lord kind of laid this on my heart a week or so ago and I started thinking about it. And um, I'm titling this little series From Gethsemane to Golgotha and Beyond. And we're going to be looking today at four different books, so all four Gospels, basically. We're going to look at the accounts of when Jesus is taken into custody as he's coming out of the Garden of Gethsemane. Actually, he's in the Garden of Gethsemane and they bring him out to then uh, take before Pilate. Next week, we'll focus on Golgotha. And then the following week will be Easter, so we'll focus on the resurrection that day. So this will be a very condensed study, uh, but I found it pretty fascinating as I look. We're going to start in John 18 is where we're going to begin and read his account and then we'll go back and we're going to read Matthew Matthew's account Mark's account and Luke's account and then finish back up with John's again as we go through so that's why I kind of want to get started as soon as I could because we got a lot of ground to cover today um, so John 18 if we want to read that account real quick it goes um, basically through verse 13 pretty much um, I guess 12 is really where the other stories end. So let's read the first 12 verses. In John 18, uh, it says, When Jesus has spoken these words, that's kind of significant. Actually, it's very sig- significant. The, all four Gospels, first of all, have this story in it. And all four Gospels begin with that phrase, when he had spoken these words. So what were the words he had spoken? We'll find out as we go through, but if you go back to chapter 17, it is what I call the true Lord's Prayer. (laughs) It's His prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane as He's praying over us, really, and His immediate disciples that were there with Him, and what's going to happen as the church begins to build is basically what uh, chapter 17 is all about. He's in the Garden. Of course, we know the common... um, pictures of not my will but yours be done he was under great distress he sweat as it were great drops of blood Um, the disciples kept falling asleep (laughs) as he asked them to stay and keep watch and pray with them watch and pray kind of thing and they kept going to sleep we don't get that in john's account if you read through there um, john doesn't mention any of that it just mentions in detail Jesus's prayer and then chapter 18 opens with when Jesus has spoke these words he went forth with his disciples over the brook Sidron or Kidron some translations put that the Kidron Valley is where that is today Uh, the brook Sidron where was a garden into the which he entered and his disciples and Judas also which betrayed him knew the place for Jesus oft times resorted thither with his disciples. Judas then, having received a band of men and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, cometh thither with lanterns and torches and weapons. The terms we're going to really focus on who John mentions versus the others and what John mentions that they show up with. Here he says they came with lanterns, torches, and weapons. Verse 4 says, Jesus therefore, knowing all things that should come upon him, went forth and said unto them, Whom seek ye? Now before we read through this, this is the only account of the four Gospels that has this in it. The other three don't even have this story in it at all. It doesn't mean that they're incorrect. It just means they all told a slightly different take on it. But this is the only account where this little passage is in there. Question? 
Well, we haven't got to it yet, but it said that uh, Peter took the uh, high priest servant's ear off. Yeah. Sword. But it doesn't mention that Jesus healed it. It does in another account. That's, That's why we're going to go through all four of them to get okay. the whole story. We're kind of doing an investigative report today. and We're looking at all the different witnesses, in this case four of them, and we'll piece the story together with all four different accounts. So he says, verse, uh, again, verse 4, they all show up. Jesus asked, Whom seek ye? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. And Judas also, which betrayed him, stood with them. As soon as he had said unto them, I am he, they went backward and fell to the ground. That's a pretty powerful moment there. It's just like, I don't know if this is just the power of God, just what happened exactly. But they all literally fell down to the ground. And I like what he did. I'm assuming as they're getting back up, he just asked the same question again. Whom seek ye? <laughs> like, do you really want to go here kind of thing? Of course, he knew this had to happen. And they said, verse 7, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I have told you that I am he. If therefore you seek me, let these go their way. So his primary concern in this moment, in this passage, is the safety of the other disciples. He wanted them to not be caught up in any of the, the struggle here. And verse 9 says, That the same might be fulfilled which he spake of, of them which thou gavest me, have I lost none? So this is an Old Testament uh, prophecy. Anybody know what that's a quote of? Mind references chapter 17, verse 12. But it's an Old Testament prophecy that that is a fulfillment of. Verse 10, We. this is the only account behind this somewhat humorous. Um, it's been told traditionally and historically that John and Peter kind of always had a little bit of competition between the two. You know, they were the first four disciples chosen was Peter and Andrew and John and James. And they were both fishermen, you know, of two different families. And But they were out there working together, uh, you know, as fishermen are. I'm sure they had a little competition between the two. Who can catch the most fish, the biggest fish and all that. And John is the only one that writes who this person was that cut off the ear of the soldier. He just comes right out and name drops him and says, Simon Peter having a sword. <laughs> the other ones just say one of the twelve smote him, or one that was with them smote him. But John's like, no, it was Peter. I'll tell on him. <laughs> says, then Simon Peter having a sword drew it and smote the high priest's servants uh, and cut off his right ear. That's kind of significant. The servant's name was Malchus. This is the only place in the Bible where we read his name. So John gives a lot of details uh, that the other accounts don't give. And then verse 11 confirms again, this is Peter. Jesus said unto Peter, Put up thy sword into thy sheath. The cup which my father gaveth me, shall I not drink it? And then verse 12 kind of concludes the story, which my Bible puts it in a separate little subcategory of the story moving forward that says that and the band key word there band I want to focus on that as we get through and the captain and uh, officers of the Jews took Jesus and bound him so that's John's account any thoughts questions or anything that's that's the most common one that people read because it has the most details as to who had the sword um, what the guy's name was they got his ear cut off you're right, it doesn't mention that it heals him in this account, but it does in another account. Perhaps it mentions Malchus' name because John's the writer, right? Correct? John he is the writer. Malchus. Right, yeah. He, I think he, he did have a personal kind of relationship with him and, and pretty close, so he knew this guy. Uh, but that's one account of it. Let's go back to Matthew, and we're going to work our way through, again... Uh, all four accounts this morning. And I want to give a little backstory of the writers to kind of give a little context. Um, so Matthew was one of the twelve disciples, as we know. 
So we know that he was an eyewitness to these things. Unlike Mark and Luke, they were not eyewitnesses to this account. Uh, John was an eyewitness. He was there as well. Uh, so Matthew and John are the only two that were first-person eyewitness accounts of these things happening. Also, what's interesting, I find a little interesting, is when these accounts were written. So does anybody know when the book of Matthew was written? It was like 60 years after Christ died. It, it was the most. After, it was after he died. Most theologians put um, this around 85 AD. So yeah, about 50, 60 years after Jesus died and rose again. So this was a much later written account. Of course, we know Matthew is to be very detail oriented, right? Through his early. Uh, chapters where he goes to the genealogy and all that and he gives some details that are somewhat unique to just Matthew but they're very similar to Mark's account so we'll see that as we go through so we're going to be looking at Matthew 26 you know starting in verse uh, 47 down to 56 again if you back up just a tad into uh, earlier in chapter 26 and verse 45 says uh, Jesus is out there praying um, verse 42 he says oh my father this cup may not pass away from me except I drink it thy will be done and he's already talked to his disciples a couple of times about trying to stay awake and praying he fusses at him in verse 40 what could you not watch with me one hour <laughs> Uh, watch and pray that you enter not in temptation. Well, he comes back after he's said this great statement of not my will, but yours be done. He found them asleep again because their eyes were heavy, verse 43 says. Uh, 44, he says, he left them and went away again and prayed a third time, saying the same words. Verse 45 says, Then come he to his disciples and said to them, Sleep on now and take your rest. Behold, the hour is at hand. And the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. That's significant to a different account we're going to read. Um, rise, let us be going. Behold, he is at hand that doth betray me. Sounds a little weird to read in verse 45. What does he tell him to do? Sleep. Sleep. What does he tell him in verse 46? Get up. <laughs> So, what can we kind of deduce by this? What can we infer between those two verses? It don't sound like there was a time lapse. Right, or there maybe was, and we don't know that. Again, we're just reading of an account. Yeah, we don't know if there was a time period. Maybe he was going to let them rest, and then you know he being all knowing realize Jesus is on his way. He's like, get up, we gotta go, kind of thing. Jesus was the boss. Jesus was the boss, yeah. So at, at one point he's telling them to sleep, to have rest, and then for whatever reason, either that's immediately after or a little bit after, we don't know, he tells them to rise, let us be going. He is hand that doth betray me. And while he yet spake, is where our kind of passage starts, verse 47. While he's saying this, and what is he saying? Get up, we gotta go. Is basically what he's just finished saying. While he yet spake, lo, Judas, one of the twelve, points out, came, and with him, here's the verbiage that Matthew uses. Came with him a great multitude with swords and staves from the chief priests and elders of the people. So we find a lot of information out in this one little passage. Do what? What is a stave? It's more like a spear or something. Like a spear or what do you, what do you think? It says a club. A club, yeah, it's kind of like a, a spear's yeah. handle or something you whack people or stab <laughs> people with kind of thing. So a sword and staves is what Matthew mentions. John mentioned Lanterns, weapons, and what else did he mention? I forgot already. Um, he said lanterns, lanterns, torches, yeah. Lanterns, torches, and weapons. 
We don't get the torches and the lanterns in this, but doesn't mean they weren't there. It was night. They were it was night. Wandering through. So they would have had some kind of light to be walking by. And to look for the weather. And to, exactly. So that's that's totally normal to see that they would have lanterns um, and torches. But Matthew doesn't mention that. He mentions swords and staves, which are certainly weapons. And it says that they came from the chief priests and elders. That's who was listed there as who sent them. And that he has a great multitude with him. How big is a great multitude? We don't really know. We just know that it's a great multitude. Verse 48. Now he that betrayed him gave them a sign, saying, Whomsoever I shall kiss... That same is he, hold him fast. John never mentioned that when we read that account. Again, doesn't mean that this is inaccurate. It just means different details are given by the different accounts. John never mentioned the kiss at all in his account. But here we see where Judas had this deal. The guy walk up and kiss, that's him. Hold him fast is the terminology that Matthew writes. And forthwith he came to Jesus and said, Hail, Master, and kissed him. I did not imagine what was going through his mind, knowing what he is about to do to the one he's been following around for the last few years. Seeing all that he had seen, I just, I don't know, what would y'all? I don't know. Of course, what happened at the Last Supper as Judas was about to go do what he was going to do. What, is, what does the account say? It says that he, Satan entered into him. Yeah. I mean, so he was pretty bad off <laughs> in this moment. But and there's another place in the Bible where it says that he was never, uh, Judas was never, he was like, I don't know, Predestined, or I'm using the wrong word. It's obvious. Right. So he was. It, that was the plan all along. Yeah. Kind of like he was never. Yeah. I don't know that I can say he was never a believer, but he was. It was like he was meant to. That was. He was right. right. That was part of it. And again, that that gets into some weird theology. I, uh, I, I think it goes to everyone has a choice, but God knew, knowing the choices that He would make, pre-designated this to be the person to do this because he had to be someone who was close to him yeah it's just it's a little unsettling and then, and then him hanging himself you know it's right just, it's just i don't know it's, it's a little weird, weird a little yeah. unsettling um but he came right up to jesus kissed him and jesus said man you know this had to stab him right in the conscience and in the heart jesus said to him friend mm -hmm. mm. <laughs> Knowing what he just did yeah. and calls him friend, wherefore art thou come, man? You know, I, I I use that strategy, and it's a biblical strategy. I think it comes from in some, the Old Testament somewhere. Um, the Old Testament tells us that if you're a good parent, that you will at least question your children when they're doing something wrong. So I do that even at school. When the kids are acting up and doing something they're not supposed to be doing, that's the first thing I ask them. What are y'all doing over there? <laughs> to make them answer that to themselves of, well, we're not doing what we're supposed to be doing. <laughs> to get them thinking. kind of thing. And this is what Jesus did with Judas. Why have you come? I mean, Jesus knew the answer, but he wanted Judas to ponder that in that moment. And they came, it says, Then came they and laid hands on Jesus and took him. And behold... One of them, it doesn't say, that's all it says, one of them, which were with Jesus, stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and smote off his ear. We don't get a name. We don't get which ear. We just get, he got his ear cut off. And Jesus said unto him, so we know that this is Peter, right? Um, but we don't know that it's Peter from this account. And while we get this little conversation, um, it says, Put up again thy sword into its place. For all they that take the sword shall perish with the sword. Well, that's, we'll read that phrase, you know, live by the sword, die by the sword. 
think it's not that this is not in John's account and I believe this is the only account if I remember correctly that mentions this in this kind of detail thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my father and he shall presently give me more than twelve legions of angels but how then shall the scriptures be fulfilled that it must be that thus that it must be he's saying this has got to happen of course what conversation did he have with Peter a little bit earlier when he said to Peter I got to go into Jerusalem and be killed what was Peter's reaction he starts arguing with Jesus saying no we'll never let that happen I'll, I'll die with you then he ends up being the one that denies him three times it even knows who he is so Peter was pretty rambunctious in that I'm going to keep this from happening. Jesus already said it's going to. I'm going to try to stop this. But Jesus has already said this is my purpose. This is why I have come. I was to this end, as Jesus said to Pilate, to this end was I born. When he's standing there talking to Pilate about all this, it's like this is a reason I was born to begin with, was to die, to be the sacrifice for all mankind. And they, he mentions that here in verse 54. It says, How then shall the scriptures be fulfilled? That thus it must be. This has got to happen. Notice about the twelve legions of angels. This is the only passage that mentions that. Does anybody know how many that is? So a Roman legion was 6,000. And some accounts that refer to legions can be as high as 12,000 or double that. So if you put those numbers in there, that's anywhere from 72,000 to 144,000 angels <laughs> that Jesus could have just summoned on the spot to take care of this. He said, do you not know that I've got this? If I really needed your help, <laughs> I can do this myself. I can just call for these hundreds of thousands of angels to show up says here in 2 Kings 19 that a single angel killed 185,000 men in yeah. a single night. 185,000 men, a single angel. Could you imagine what 144,000 angels could do? <laughs> it's pretty crazy. So Jesus had that at his disposal, yet he chose to go through with the plan, again, which was the plan all along. Verse 55 says, In that same hour Jesus said to the multitudes, Again, when we go back, verse 47, a great multitude had shown up. So it says in the same hour, Jesus said to the multitudes, Are you come out against me as a thief with swords and staves? Again, that's what he's mentioned there in verse 47. To take me? I sat daily with you teaching in the temple, and you laid no hold on me then. He didn't say then, but he says you laid no hold on me. But all this was done that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. That's significant that he mentions the prophets. Who sent these people? Priest. The chief priests and the elders who are all about the prophets. And Jesus says, well, the prophets spoke this into prophecy way back when, and this is a fulfillment of the guys that you claim to be on their side. This is a fulfillment of what the prophets said. Then all the disciples forsook him and fled. That's kind of an interesting detail. We see that in other accounts as well. So did we see that in John? John, it said, does not mention that. It just says that the band, the captain, the officer of the Jews took him and bound him. So that's a little bit different detail. Then all the disciples forsook him and fled. So that's Matthew's account. Uh, again, the 12 legions of angels is unique. To this account we don't get who had the sword uh, and or which ear was cut off and we see that swords and staves are mentioned as what these people show up showed up with all right so mark 14 is the next one so while you're finding your place there mark 14 we're looking at verse 43 so mark was not one of the twelve um, he was we're cruising through with time here. Uh, he was a travel companion to Paul, and he also knew Peter very well. Um, so his accounts are from 
conversations that he had with at least Peter, who was a eyewitness to all these things. Of course, he's the one with the sword. We find out by John. Uh, Paul was not an eyewitness to any of this, but he was a, an apostle because he had, had an encounter with Christ on the road to Damascus. Uh, so Paul knew a lot. He spoke a lot with Christ through the Holy Spirit. We find out through the book of Acts that Jesus spoke to him through his spirit, basically, directly, or an angel. Um, so he had a lot of conversations with Jesus through that means, but he wasn't here for all of this sort of stuff. Uh, but in uh, what we can can learn about Mark is Colossians chapter verse uh, chapter four verse ten tells us that Marcus is his name was it says that he was the sister's son to Barnabas. Um, Acts twelve twelve is where we're introduced to Mark for the first time in the book of Acts as far as his relationship to all the other people. Um, what happened in Acts 12:12 12, 12 is uh, right before there. James, John's brother, had been killed with a sword. Peter had been put in prison for preaching the gospel. King Herod intended to kill Peter after the celebration of the holiday that was going on. It says Easter in the King James Bible, which is actually a reference to a holiday called Ishtar. Because Easter wasn't declared a holiday until 325 A.D. Uh, as an actual name of a holiday. Uh, but the actual holiday mentioned there is called Ishtar. is a pagan holiday that goes all the way back. It's a long story. Uh, but King Herod was a pagan. He wasn't a Jew. So he wasn't celebrating Passover. He was celebrating Ishtar. And anyway, he had intentions to kill Peter after that holiday passed. And while this was happening, an angel comes and releases Peter from prison. And Peter goes to the house of Mary, it says there in Acts 12, which is Barnabas' sister, which means that John Mark was Barnabas' nephew. That's how he is tied in with Paul. Paul, his, you know, his ministry partner was Barnabas. Well, Barnabas' nephew was John Mark, or Mark of the Gospel of Mark. Acts 15 tells us about an argument that blew up between Paul and Barnabas over John Mark uh, because it says that he did not um, continue in the in the, the ministry or however it is they phrased it. Basically he turned back for a while um, and Paul didn't have a whole lot of confidence in Mark. And that's why Paul and that's Barnabas... this Mark? This Mark. This is the same Mark. Yeah. I mean, I remember that story. Yeah, but this is the mark they're talking about. And maybe he was homesick. Maybe he was homesick. I don't know. Some say that his you know, mother could have been sick and he went home to take care of her. Yeah, yeah, um, but this is, yeah, this is the same guy. So Paul and Barnabas split ways, and that's where we got Paul and Silas in the story, because Silas kind of replaced Barnabas. Um, but later on, we read in Philemon 1.24 that he, Paul mentions Marcus by name as Marcus and calls him his fellow laborer. So at some point, they reestablished you know, uh, some good standing between each other. 2 Timothy 4.11, uh, Paul uh, writes and says, Mark, calls him Mark instead of Marcus, Mark was profitable to him for the ministry. So at some point he did restore some good standing uh, in the ministry. In 1 Peter 5.13, Peter refers to Marcus as my son, meaning in the faith. He's a student of mine. He's someone that I considered to be my own son. That's how close we are in relation. So Mark got his information from Peter and from Paul. So this is what he writes about these accounts. Verse 43, And immediately while he yet spake, of course that leads us back a couple of verses to find out what he just spit, spoken. And the story is the same as we read in Matthew. Verse 41 says, that He looked at the disciples, he came a third time, they were asleep. He said, Sleep on now, take your rest, it is enough, the hour has come. Behold, the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. And then he says, in the next verse, rise up, 
Let us go. He that betrayeth me is at hand. Says it a little different way, but basically says the same thing. So they're up. They're going to the meeting place where Jesus, of course, knew this was going to happen. And as they're heading there, it says, Immediately, while he yet spake, come Judas, Judas, one of the twelve. He mentions one of the twelve again there. And with him a great multitude, same details that Matthew gave us, with swords and staves. Now he adds something here. From the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. The scribes were not mentioned by Matthew. But again, it doesn't mean it's not true. It just means different details given by a different person. Verse 44 says, And he that betrayed him had given them a token, saying, Whomsoever I shall kiss, the same as he, take him and lead him away safely. Now when was Mark written? Because a lot of people are like, Well, Mark just stole all this information from Matthew. Which is a possible point, but when was the book of Mark written? What y'all's resources say? Didn't we talk about this before? Yeah. The 60s, yep. years after the death of... Well, it was actually year, probably as soon as year 60. Yeah. So it's like 25 years before Matthew wrote his account. Yeah. Oh, yeah, 60 years would have made an old man. <laughs> so, so Mark was the first gospel written of the four. It was written the earliest. So we know he didn't get his details from Matthew. Some suggest Matthew maybe got his details from Mark. The only issue with that is Matthew was an eyewitness to all these things happening. So they must have shared information quite accurately with Mark as he was traveling around with, with Peter and Paul through the book of Acts. But anyway, um, he says, that Him who I kiss, the same as he, take him and lead him away safely. Interesting ways that they phrase that. Verse 45 says, As soon as he was come, he goes straightway to him and saith, Master, Master, and kissed him. We do not get the blurb about Jesus saying, Friend, why have you come? They omit that here. And they laid their hands on him and took him. And one of them, not one of the twelve, but one of them that stood by, drew a sword and smote the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. Same information, basically. And Jesus answered and said, to them, are ye come out against a thief with swords and with staves to take me? Notice the conversation with Peter didn't happen in this account. Doesn't mean it didn't happen, just means that he didn't write it down. Again, which would make sense because Mark was not there. And I, I kind of wonder if Peter would have told on himself when he talked to Mark <laughs> about this. <laughs> in verse 51, mm -hmm. um, I've written in my Bible that it was John Mark so, if that was the case, he was eyewitness. Could have been from a distance. Yeah, we'll get to that here in a second. So, it could have been. You're right. We don't know that for certain, but it could have been. Uh, verse 49, before we get there, it says, I, Jesus said, I was daily with you in the temple teaching, and you took me not. But the scriptures must be fulfilled. Condensed version of what was said, but still there. And they all forsook him and fled. That's kind of the end of the story. But Mark does add two more verses that does indicate that, yes, maybe he was there. He wasn't one of the twelve. But it does say there followed him a certain young man. He would not name himself if this is indeed him. A certain young man having a linen cloth cast about his naked body. And the young men laid hold on him. I'm assuming, from what all I can research, the young men were the people there that were there to capture Jesus. They probably left a few behind to make sure the disciples didn't follow them or something. They tried to lay hold on this certain young man. And the certain young man says that he left the linen cloth and fled from them naked. Weird random verse just thrown in there that <laughs> seems to have no significance. But, to your point, that could be enough evidence that he could have been an eyewitness, at least standing from a distance. Maybe he didn't hear and see everything exactly maybe the way the others did, but he was possibly there because most theologians agree that this certain young man was indeed Mark. He just didn't name himself. Maybe he was embarrassed about it or something. I don't know. So, <laughs> but, he ran away naked, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> so you said 
Mark was following Paul, which would have been Saul at that time? First no. Peter the Christian? Mark joined up with Paul after Paul's conversion through the book of Acts. Okay. Okay. I through the I book process that yeah. in my head and it didn't make sense. Yeah, through the book of Acts and the rest of the books that Paul wrote after his conversion, that's when he and Mark and Peter they were all together traveling. We found out Luke was also a travel companion to Paul. Okay. This was all after Paul's conversion. Yeah. He wasn't associated with Saul. Okay. He was associated with Paul later on. So, you know, he wouldn't have known Paul or Saul at this point in the story. Because gotcha. this was written before his death. And then later on, after Paul's conversion, is when Mark joined up with him and became a travel companion. Yeah. All right, so that's that account. Let's look at Luke. Uh, Luke was, again, a uh, travel companion to Paul and Peter, I'm sure, as well as Marcus, we find out, or Mark. Um, he wasn't one of the twelve. Luke was written, again, about the same time Matthew was, around 80 to 90 is what most experts say. And uh, in Philemon 1.24, again, it mentions uh, four names, just specifically as to being Paul's fellow laborers, Two of those names was Marcus and Lucas, meaning Mark and Luke. Colossians 4.14, Paul writes and mentions Luke by name. It says, Luke, the beloved physician, and Demas greet you. It's just kind of a passing statement, but we learn that Luke is a doctor. That's how we come to know that he's a doctor through Paul and that he was a travel companion to Paul, which also meant... He was a travel companion to Peter at some point. He talked with Mark a lot. So a lot of these guys shared the same information because they shared the same relationship with people. So Luke's account says this in verse 47. What chapter? Uh, yeah. Sorry, Luke 22. Luke 22. Verse 46, before we go there, says uh, Jesus came after his little time in the garden praying. And he doesn't say... Rest, sleep on, get some rest, and then he tells them to get up and go. Luke's account says, why are you sleeping? Rise and pray. And rise and pray, he says, lest you enter into temptation. And he doesn't say, let's go, the guy's coming. He leaves those details out, which is, again, not showing an error, just showing a different perspective. And then it says in verse 47, while he yet spake, behold a multitude... And he that was called Judas, one of the twelve, went before him and drew near unto Jesus to kiss him. So all three of these accounts mention the kiss. John's doesn't. But Jesus said to him, Judas, betrayest thou the Son of Man with a kiss? That's new. That's not in any of the other three accounts. Um, he uses the title Son of Man there, which is a reference back to Daniel chapter 7, verse 13 where Daniel had this vision and a prophecy, and he spoke this, I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days. That's a capital A in, my, in, my, in the King James Bible. And they brought him near before him. So that phrase, Son of Man, is a reference to the coming Messiah, the Ancient of Days, the one who comes to you know, restore and build the kingdom of God. So he refers to himself there as the son of man. Um, a little bit different, again, uh, take on it. But Luke, again, was not an eyewitness. You know, Mark might have been closer to it than Luke would have been. Um, verse 49 says, And when they were about him, saw, uh, when, sorry, when they which were about him saw what would follow, so this is his immediate disciples. This is new. This is the only account that says this. So the people standing there with Jesus said unto him, Lord, shall we smite with a sword? They're like, should we fight back? That's not mentioned in Matthew, Mark, or John. Interesting. And one of them smote the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. Here we find out that this is his right ear. Still don't know that this is Peter. 
through this account. We find that out from John. And Jesus answered and said, Suffer ye thus far. Here's where we get that he healed him. And he touched his ear and healed him. This is the only account. Of course, that makes sense because what was Luke? He was a physician, a doctor. And that fascinated him that Jesus could just pick up his ear and put it back on and heal him. Pretty cool. So this is the account where we find out that he was healed and his ear was put back on. Verse 52, Then Jesus said to the chief priests and the captains of the temple and the elders which were come with him, Be ye come out as a thief with swords and staves? When I was daily with you in the temple, ye stretched forth no hands against me. But this is your hour. Interesting how Jesus said that. And the power of darkness. He was like, this is going to show the world how you really are and who you really are. Of course, to this day, the Jews still deny that they had anything to do with Jesus' crucifixion. They're like, the Romans did that. That wasn't us. But Jesus said, this is your doing. This is your hour. This is going to show the world what you're really all about. And you're denying me as Christ. Verse 54 says, then they took him and led him. But then again, if we go back to John 18, where we started today, you know, he gives uh, some of the same details, some further details, and some information that we didn't get in any of the other four um, examples of where they, you know, he asked, "Who do you seek?" and he he said, "I'm He." They all fell down and all this sort of stuff. Um, we also get in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. What did they call the people that showed up with Judas? They called them a great multitude or simply multitude. In John's account, verse 3 says that Judas, having received a band of men, that word band in the Roman definition is 600 men. So he shows up with 600 people all sent there from the chief priest. The Pharisees are mentioned in John's account. The other accounts mention elders and scribes. So these are all religious people that sent these 600 guys with Judas to take Jesus. And Jesus is like, really? (laughs) It's just me. What's all this, this all about? And then again, to put that in context, could you imagine the sound even of 600 people with swords and staves and lanterns, all probably armor on, we don't know, all of them falling down at the same time when Jesus says, I am he. And everybody just falls down. They're all getting back up. He was like, I ask you again, who are you looking for? I kind of wonder the, the tone behind that conversation. They got it and had a lot of trepidation, you know, when Jesus the guy leader back on and all of a sudden he's oh yeah back. well you know wait a minute <laughs> should we be taking this guy exactly well then I should know his name in the dome who was the soldier at the uh, cross at Golgotha I may know his name I would imagine he was probably one of these yeah and he said surely this was the son of God so you had to think back to this moment some of them really started thinking hmm should we really be following through with this, like Bill said? Pretty cool. So what do y'all think? That's the four different accounts. Those are the accounts that were given in God's Word to learn from regarding Jesus' uh, moment of being taken into custody. Um, what do y'all think about the different accounts? I appreciate you digging all that out. It's pretty cool. Put it together. Yeah. 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 And there's not one single account that tells us the whole story, and that's why it's important to read all three, or all four, so that we can piece together all the information. And that's what they do in a court of law. You know, they'll ask a bunch of different witnesses you and they'll take the same account. That's right. right, you never get the same account, which it's is realistic. Of what happened in the situation. And then through all of those accounts they piece together the story and that's how we find out what really happened. Which is why I like to study stuff like this in that way. So that we can just kind of put it all together. But I not I have you know, it all says something a little differently, but I do not find any inconsistencies 
you know, it's stuff like this that atheists jump all over and they say, well, this one said this and that one said that and y'all can't even get your story straight. I've had atheists telling me that. Said, you, you, the guys that wrote down the Bible couldn't even get their story straight. How in the world do you want me to believe in that? Well, if you put it all together, there's nothing that contradicts each other. It's all, it's all cohesive. It just, it's all a different little perspective or maybe experience that they had. Even Mark, I like that. Uh, Charlotte, you pointed that out. That if that it was indeed him, which no one really discounts, and most people say that he was that young man that ran away naked. Um, that he was probably the closest thing to an eyewitness account that you could get without being feet away from Jesus. He so, made sure his name wasn't. Right. Like, I'm not saying my name. And I still find it hilarious that John's the only one that said, Peter's the one with the sword. He cut his ear off. And none of the other accounts say that John went with them. Because it said that the other disciples were afraid of him. Yeah. Right. Yeah, so he's the only one that's going to be out. I went all the way up to the high priest's house. You know. Yeah, and you do find, if you keep reading um, through the accounts, um, let's see where it was. I think it was, is it Luke? Yeah, Luke. And uh, again, he was a travel companion to Paul and to Marcus, possibly Peter. It says they took him and led him and brought him to the high priest's house, and Peter followed afar off. So they all kind of ran, but they did kind of regroup, and they were following from a distance trying to figure out what was going on, where they were leading him. Yeah, John, he rarely mentions himself. But I think at some point I got the idea that John was there right. with Jesus. Although Peter was the only one told about. Right. And again, John, for some reason, even when in the selection process of the disciples, he never mentions his own name. He says another disciple. He's just very humble, I guess, in that way. It could He's also be the, the time he was writing, they were possibly looking for him. Well, that's true, too. So if he didn't want to call his letters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. when was well, when was John, the book of John, written? Anybody know that? I looked up different ones. One of them said 50 to 60. Let's see. Okay. Some do state that it could have been that early, like Mark's. Uh, Matthew's and Luke's, they seem to place it more around 85. Yeah, and some of the resources I've looked at says 85 to 90. So would it have been them writing it? Wouldn't they? Yeah, John. Now John was alive. He he lived till 100 years old. But I mean, Luke. Didn't. Well, if Luke. So Luke. I mean, we were not told about his death. He wasn't one of the twelve that got beheaded or ran through with a sword or anything. So I mean, if John lived that long, they could have lived that long for sure. Yeah. Peter, we know, was eventually crucified upside down. Well, that's the the traditional history behind it. Uh, and John, we know, lived, he, he was banished to the Isle of Patmos, which is where he wrote the book of Revelation. Um, and for the best of the history I know, the book of John was written as possibly as soon as 60. But it says 80 to 90, 50 yeah, years. That most, he witnessed Jesus most people place it 80 to 85 to 90, somewhere around there. And then they place 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John being written between 90 and 95. Mm -hmm. And then the book of Revelation between 95 and 100. And he died at either the age of 99 or 100. According and Ephesus is where his grave is. According to my Bible, Luke would have been written before John. It says 63 to 68. Okay, so they put it a little earlier. Yeah, you get different sources. It's hard to really piece it together. But it makes sense. Around 60 is some of the earliest times were given. And as late as AD 85 or some of the later times that were given. Right, so. But cool, interesting stuff. Anybody got any other thoughts before we close out? These guys were all old men when they wrote the. Yeah, they were, they were elderly and had thought about it a while and finally put it down. Well, I guess if they had gone through it, at the time, it was all 
what was going on right now that mm -hmm. were reacting to yeah that. they're that running for their lives and, and then later on in life they said man i need to i need right. to record this stuff mm -hmm. and so that, that makes a lot of sense that's yeah. absolutely does all right, well, that's our first stop on our journey from Gethsemane to Golgotha and beyond. Next week, we'll look at Golgotha, and then we'll look at the empty tomb on Easter. So we'll see you guys online next week as we do our next stop, and I hope you guys have a good week.